United States has deployed missile defense system, so-called missile defense system, into Romania, what they call Aegis Ashore. The Aegis uh, warships made in Bath, Maine, where I live, are outfitted with these missile defense systems, uh, SM-3 interceptor missile, and in fact, they have the best testing record of all the various missile defense systems. There are about four or five different missile defense systems. Some test better than others. This one tests the best. So well that they decided, let's call it Aegis Ashore as well and put it on the ground. And so the first permanent Aegis Ashore uh, deployment is now in Romania. And they're going to do another one in Poland next year. Oops. So the groundbreaking, here it looks like they're digging a grave, but actually it's a groundbreaking uh, for these systems. Uh, they're very excited about Aegis Ashore, and they have the testing area on the island of Kauai in Hawaiian Islands for the Aegis Ashore system. So coupled with the onboard ships and this particular system, they're very excited about it. And what you should know about missile defense is that it's a key element in U.S. first strike attack planning. The idea is that after you launch a first strike attack on Russia or China, try to take out their ground-based nuclear forces, they then fire a retaliatory strike. And it is then that missile defense is used as a shield to pick off the retaliatory strike, giving the U.S. a quote-unquote successful first strike attack. When George W. Bush became president, one of the first things he did was withdraw from the ABM Treaty, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, that outlawed these destabilizing systems. Now, today, we hear both Russia and China say, forget about nuclear disarmament negotiations. We can't afford to negotiate. We can't afford to reduce our levels of nuclear weapons at a time when you're introducing the shield. All right, it gives you an advantage. So forget about it. And so today the U.S. is on steroids encircling both Russia and China with these systems. At the same time, the United States has now moved into Ukraine, fostering in early 2014, directing a takedown of the Ukrainian government. Victoria Nuland, working for Hillary Clinton at the time as Assistant Secretary of State for Euro European Affairs bragged that the U.S. spent five billion dollars on the operation to take down the legitimately elected government of Ukraine. And the first thing that the new uh, parliament in Kiev did after the takedown was to outlaw the speaking of Russian in Ukraine. Now imagine that. Well, as you can see here, this is mostly Russian speakers, or this color here, which are primarily along the Russian border in the eastern Ukraine, what's called the Donbass region. And so the people in the Donbass region began nonviolently protesting, not Russian separatists, as we hear in the media in America, but federalists saying we should be able to speak our own language, we should be able to elect our own mayors, instead of having them appointed by the government in Kiev, we should have local autonomy. And so they began circulating petitions and having marches, nonviolent marches, and circulating petitions saying, we want to be able to speak our own language. And as a result, what happened? They were attacked by the Nazis in Ukraine, in Western Ukraine, over near Poland. This is the breeding ground of the Nazis in Ukraine. During World War II, when Hitler swept through Ukraine in its invasion of the former Soviet Union and ultimately Russia, when they passed through Western Ukraine, a guy by the name of Stefan Bandera, a nationalist, put on a Nazi uniform and organized his followers to join the onslaught of Russia. And so he's hated. He's despised within the Russian community, right? Whether it's Eastern Ukraine or whether it's in Russia itself. And so today the Bandera forces are instrumental in the government of in Kiev 
and they've been the ones that are leading the attack in eastern Ukraine, shelling schools, hospitals, daycare centers, churches, housing blocks, apartment blocks, killing thousands of innocent people. And so the miners and other civilians began to arm themselves, and admittedly Russia has provided them with arms. Russia has not invaded, as we keep hearing in the Western media, but Russia has indeed arm the self-defense forces in the Donbass so they can protect themselves against this U.S.-directed onslaught against them by these Nazis. In fact, if you just Google it on YouTube, uh, U.S. ambassador visiting uh, Western Ukraine uh, base. In Western Ukraine, there is now a base where the U.S. Special Forces from Fort Carson, Colorado come and train these Nazis who have now been incorporated into the National Guard, which didn't exist prior to the coup d'etat that the U.S. directed in that country. So one of the places where they were collecting signatures and trying to say we want to have our own elections is in Odessa. And on May 2nd, 2014, outside the Trades Hall, these people had gathered what we would call tabling. They, there's a big park surrounding this area. A lot of people walk through here. And they were collecting signatures, and they had little booths and tents kind of thing. And they were attacked by several thousand Nazis that were bussed in from other parts of the country. And many people believe that it was a, a US-directed CIA operation. They attacked the tabling area where the people were, the people ran inside the trades hall to protect themselves, and the Nazis armed with Molotov cocktails, bats, steel pipes, guns, began attacking and burning the building. And they went around the side and busted in and went inside and killed people inside, including a pregnant woman who was heard screaming. And there are videotapes, again, just YouTube, and, and videos all over that show people shooting at people in the windows trying to get some air because of the smoke inside the building. People that jumped out of the windows, landed on the ground, were immediately beaten to death with baseball bats. Mm. And the only people that have ever been prosecuted for these crimes, in spite of the fact that there's voluminous pictorial and video evidence of these crimes, the only people that have ever been arrested and jailed are the people that survived this onslaught on May 2nd, 2014. More than 50 were killed. Some people say as many as 100, but nobody knows for sure because many of the people that were injured and taken to the hospital were then arrested and disappeared by the security forces of Ukraine. A total calamity. And so this year, this is a Molotov cocktails being thrown into the building. This year, whoops, this year on, uh, oh, I jumped ahead of myself, just an illustration of how the United States has taken over this country. Why? Let me just ask, answer this. Why? Why is the U.S. doing all this? Well, it's the proximity of Russia to Ukraine. The United States' goal is to destabilize Russia. And so by turning uh, Ukraine into chaos, then you are able to destabilize Russia and the goal being regime change in Russia. This is the security forces headquarters in Kiev. So on May 2nd this year, three of us from the United States went and stood with the Mother's Committee who were calling for international investigations against these crimes. This summer, I spent three weeks in Korea, and I went to uh, many protests against the U.S. missile defense deployment called THAAD, now going into Korea. When I arrived on an airplane, this is the paper that was being handed to us as we boarded to fly into Seoul. China is very worried because THAAD is being aimed at all the U.S. missile defense systems deployed in Japan and in South Korea are being aimed at. China, even though we're told they're re really being placed there because of North Korea. North Korea is just an excuse. There's a community named Songju, 10,000 people, melon farmers, that are protesting, and every night for the last 
Uh, several months they've held a candlelight vigil and they draw up to 10,000 people at a time at this event. This is a picture of the candlelight vigil. And they've been so successful at turning this issue into a national issue that the, gov the U.S. government is now talking about maybe moving this, this deployment away from this community. The interesting thing about Songju is in the last election, this is a conservative community, in the last election, 86% of the residents voted for the right-wing government in Korea. And because of this deployment in Songju that the United States wished to place there, the people held a mock funeral and resigned from the ruling party. And they have now joined the peace movement in Korea. I think it's a great illustration that we should never demonize people on the right, which we often do, because it takes just a moment, it takes one experience, one uh, change in, in, uh, in uh, situation that people could possibly turn our way and become our allies. We had a protest in front of the U.S. headquarters in Seoul. This means no in Korea. I'm standing next to, as you can see, a THAAD missile there. And that evening, 10,000 people gathered in the Seoul, Seoul uh, City Hall Plaza uh, protesting. This man, one of the leaders from Songju. And in Songju, there's a big screen behind him. And in Songju, the residents are having a simultaneous protest. And the two protests were linked by satellite, tech, uh, satellite technology. The day, a few days after I left, 900 residents of Songju gathered and shaved their heads, which in Korea is a really big, big deal. Especially this time, many women did this, which doesn't usually happen. To shave your head in Korea means that you are fighting to the death, that you are giving everything you have to join this protest. So the people there are serious and really committed. But now, as I said, the U.S. is now talking about new, moving the, the uh, uh, THAAD, pro, uh, THAAD deployment to another community, to a nearby community. And they have now begun to rally. So the protests are spreading. Each community has a different color to identify themselves. And so now across Korea, the U.S. THAAD missile defense deployment has become the major issue in the country. And the peace movement is growing dramatically as former right-wing people are now joining the peace community. A great, great step forward for the peace movement there. Our poster for this year for Space Week has been translated into Korean and is now being uh, uh, shown around the, the country. And this is the one that we had on the seat yesterday. My time is up. Thank you all very much for listening. Thank you, Bruce. Our next speaker is Miriam Pumperton. Miriam is a research fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies. She directs its Peace Economy Transitions Project, which focuses on helping to build the foundations of a post-war economy at the federal, state, and local levels. She co-chairs the Budget Priorities Working Group, the principal information sharing collaboration of all US NGOs working on reducing Pentagon spending. She is co-editor of the book, Lessons from Iraq, Avoiding the Next War. Formerly, she was editor, researcher, and finally director of the National Commission for Economic Conversion and Disarmament. She holds a PhD from the University of Michigan. Let's welcome Miriam. driving in today and I, I was driving behind a car that had a bumper sticker that said um, I'm already opposed to the next war and I thought oh this person must be going where I'm going it didn't didn't turn out to be the case but um, it's lovely to be among friends 
Um, so as Robert mentioned, um, I work on uh, tackling the economic underpinnings of war uh, and building a peace economy. So I thought what I'd do in this short time is um, just uh, sort of quickly review uh, the requirements for, for building a peace economy um, and then what, where we are in the current moment and then offer a few couple what I see as rays of hope. There we go. So building peace economy has two parts. Um, one is to cut the military budget and reinvest. It's not enough just to cut the military budget. Um, we got to move money to the civilian side of the economy um, to create what economists call um, sort of demand pull, uh, pulling workers, communities, and businesses um, into uh, civilian uh, areas of, of work. Um, and the other thing uh, that's required is um, sort of overcoming inertia, that is um, helping workers, communities, and businesses kind of get from here to there, and, and um, uh, in, involving uh, targeted assistance and also building models showing that there's life after defense contracts. So I won't waste your time um, telling you things you already know. Um, uh, cutting the military budget, is, it's not looking good right now. Um, both of the presidential candidates that have an actual shot of being president this time around um, are talking about more money for the military. Um, and they are, of course, bolstered by what I call the congressional uh, political protection racket um, that has weapons contracts um, spread out among all congressional districts. Um, the F-35 fighter jet that is the most expensive weapon system ever envisioned at uh, a, million, a trillion and a half and counting. Um, it's built in 46 states. So there's the protection <gasps> racket right there. Um, and then you have the revolving door where, where generals who are negotiating with the contractors then go and work for the contractors and then begin lobbying the Pentagon for more, for more contracts. Um, so it's possible that uh, Pentagon spending won't actually rise um, in the next period. Um, you all know about this Budget Control Act that has put caps on both military and domestic spending. Um, and uh, what we've had is a, is a sort of stalemate between the defense hawks who want to raise military spending and, and keep domestic spending where it is or cut domestic spending, the domestic hawks that want to do the opposite. So they're in stalemate and then, um, then they're the def deficit hawks uh, that have been sort of keeping, keeping this in, in, as I say, uh, a stalemate. Um, Meanwhile, so it's, it's possible um, that, that we won't have increases in Pentagon spending, but um, as you all know very well, uh, we're spending more than the next eight countries put together um, and more than we spent during the Reagan military buildup. Um, so in terms of reinvestment, um, you know, converting swords into plowshares, a great idea. Um, the question has always been conversion to what? And um, what, we, what I've been, been saying since the, the uh, post-Cold War period, what we said back then was uh, we need a new national mission to take the place of winning the Cold War. Um, and what we said back then uh, is even clearer today that that new national mission should be creating an environmentally sustainable economy as the planet warms, um, it's even clearer that this is, is an absolutely urgent, urgent priority. And so that basically um, means a new industrial policy. And now we get to my rays of hope. Um, I think in the current, uh, on the current horizon, um, the closest thing we might get to an industrial policy, um, a civilian industrial policy, and, uh, as opposed to, of course, the military industrial policy, which is very well in, entrenched, um, the closest thing we get to that is, is um, the bipartisan support 
um, for infrastructure uh, investment. So what would that be? Well, for Donald Trump, um, it would be basically paving paradise. And for uh, Hillary Clinton, I think it would be a lot more like um, uh, the stimulus package um, that we had early in the Obama administration, um, which, which included um, about $80 billion for investment in clean energy and transportation technology. So I think um, if, we, if we have a Clinton administration, uh, she will be pushing for something like that, which would be a good thing. Of course, if she's going to build up the military, Where's the money going to come from? Um, that's, that's the big problem. Um, and uh, I, I, I would say that winning this fight um, really depends on coalition building. We're not, going to build, we're not going to win it by ourselves. We can only win it by making alliances with, with other um, strong movements. So um, this points, in my view, to connecting the anti-war movement and the climate movement. It's not a new idea. Um, uh, we've got all sorts of um, campaigns. The, the No War, No Warming campaign um, has certainly been uh, focused front and center on that, on that kind of alliance. Um, just last week, the uh, US uh, Labor Against the War came out with a really nice video on climate change. Um, the Machinist Union, which is one of the most defense-dependent unions in the country, um, uh, just passed a pretty strong climate change resolution at its, at its national um, convention. That was a pretty big deal. Um, and then the um, International Peace Bureau Conference, it's going to happen um, next weekend in Berlin. Uh, it's, it's, um, its title is Disarm for a Climate of Peace. So there are, uh, well, there's lots of activity going on um, with this alliance, and um, it seems to me the best hope for creating that kind of reinvestment um, that could be the foundation for um, an actual peace economy. So what I want to do with my remaining time is to um, make a little contribution by um, offering uh, a new resource to... I'm way behind here, I'm sorry. Here we go. Okay, no I'm not. All right, so this is the um, resource that I'm uh, going to be putting out uh, week after next, um, and I'm going to be delivering it at the, at the Berlin conference next weekend. Um, and so um, I'm giving you a little preview, but please don't, if you're a tweeter, don't tweet about this uh, until next week when, when I actually put it out. At that point, I would absolutely love your help in, in getting it out. So um, it's built on the, on the idea um, that uh, it's a good thing that the US military um, has identified climate change as a major uh, national security threat. Um, it's, problematic in a lot of ways we could talk about, but um, I do think it is an opportunity. So um, I've been doing a series of reports comparing federal spending on military security as opposed to climate security, um, and it got um, harder to do this year um, because, in fact, the federal government used to publish a federal climate change expenditures report. Um, but they stopped doing it in 2013, I suppose, because if climate change doesn't exist, why, why should you know how much you're spending on it? Um, so what my report says is um, it's a good thing that the military says this is a major uh, national security threat, but what they don't say is, therefore, we should be sh looking at our overall uh, security spending budget, and we should be shifting resources um, to climate change um, since it is um, this major security threat. So we will be aligning our security budget uh, with the magnitude of the threat as the military itself defines it. Um, so what you find out when you look at um, what we're spending on military as opposed to climate security is that um, the U.S. government uh, has invested has, has plussed up uh, the budget for climate 
um, slightly. Uh, but uh, when you look at what we're spending on the military, um, basically we're spending uh, 28 times as much on military security as we are spending on preventing climate catastrophe. Um, so I also look at uh, comparison with what China is spending. So um, as we know, China has surpassed the United States as the biggest global greenhouse uh, emitter on the planet. Um, however, in terms of federal resources spent on the problem, uh, they are China is spending, and these are not. This is we're not taking China's word for this. This is these are UN figures. Um, China uh, spends uh, one and a half times what the U.S. is spending on climate security, and uh, of course the U.S. spends two and a half times what China spends on its military. So if you look at those pies, uh, the U.S. sliver is a sliver, and China is a much better balance of security resources. Um, so how much do we need to spend? I'm, I really am wrapping up. Uh, cutting to the chase, uh, $55 billion is, is what uh, the Center for American Progress and economists at UMass Amherst say we need to be spending. So um, uh, where does that money come from? Well, there was the $21 billion that we're already spending, uh, leaving a gap of $34 billion. And as it happens, um, uh, a bunch of, it's a bipartisan coalition that I'm a part of um, that came up with uh, $38 billion in really easy, low-hanging fruit in the military budget. And so there you are, there's the shortfall. And then I came up with some trade-offs for what that money could, could be used for um, to uh, uh, to actually uh, spend, be spending what we need to be spending to um, avert climate catastrophe. So as I say, um, this report is coming out uh, uh, not this coming week, but the next week, and I would love your support um, to, to put it out. Um, uh, it'll be up on the IPS website, so ips-dc.org. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miriam. Our next speaker, Mubarak Awad, is the founder and national president of the Youth Advocate Program, which provides ultimate foster care and counseling to at-risk youth and their families. He's also the founder of the Palestinian Center for the Study of Nonviolence in Jerusalem, and was deported by the Israeli Supreme Court in 1988 after being jailed for organizing activities involving nonviolent civil disobedience. Dr. Awad has since formed Nonviolence International, which works with various movements and organizations across the globe. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, and my work has been so much with uh, a lot of you who have been here that shaped my life. Because in peace and those in human rights. And I studied in Bluffton College, a Mennonite college, so, and I'm married to a Quaker, and all those things <laughs> affect, me so, affect me so much. Uh, uh, the Palestinian issue at this time is uh, not being heard of so because of what happened in Syria and what happened in Lebanon and what happened with the ISIS. But uh, we are still there and we are still struggling and we are still under occupation and uh, our land still being taken from us and more settlements uh, on our land and we are still resisting. So that's where we are at now. I have an experience of more than 50 years in being a nonviolent activist, and it's amazing uh, that I enjoyed it. 
and the enjoyment is uh, good and bad, happiness and sadness, but really it changed my life, it changed the life of my family around me, and it affects so much uh, have on my children. So those of you who are in peace and in nonviolence and activism, please understand that affect your children too and people around you. Uh, I have a very strong family and the most enjoyable part of my family is to come and see me in jail. <laughs> and, they, and they enjoy that every time because every time I have a new story for them. And that becomes. Uh, being a Palestinian is not easy. And uh, having uh, difficulty in uh, presenting myself as a Palestinian, also as a Christian Palestinian, and that confused a lot of people because they think that being an Arab, I have to be a Muslim. And uh, then some people asked me when I was converted to Christianity, <laughs> And I will tell people, look, fellows, we were Christian from the time of Christ and the disciples. And for all of you here who are Christians, they are because of me, because of us on that. I, I built on a good, <laughs> I built on a, on a good principle. And, and the guiding uh, way for me was my mother. My father was shot when I was five years old in 1948, and my mother took me aside when I was five and told me, don't ever carry a gun, don't ever kill a person. The, the one who killed your dad, he doesn't know that he left me as a widow with seven kids. In four weeks after that, I was in an orphanage and then in a, in my school, they want to have one of those uh, army drills for two weeks. And I refused to carry a gun. I ref and they put uh, a machine gun on me, tie it on me, and they have all the students to come and spit on me for two weeks. And instead of getting upset and angry, I was very happy. I say, I, well, I made it. I was able to make it. And, and at that time, I never ever thought that this is nonviolence. It didn't occur to me that I'm doing a nonviolent act. Only when I grew up, I heard, oh, I did nonviolent when I was young <laughs> on that. But uh, we were able to project. After studying in the United States, I study sociology, I study social work, I study counseling, and I have PhD in psychology, and it was, it was a wonderful life. And I, may, I was making a lot of money. And for those of you who want to tell anybody to be a peace activist, first tell them you don't make money in peace. <laughs> you have to live a different way of life. And that's a choice that we have to make. It's a choice that we have to make and we have to stick to it. So that's uh, one part. The other thing that uh, make me as uh, I am a bully when I was in school. I am so big uh, in school. So, and uh, one time when I was six years old, I was put in an orphanage, and then I told all the students in the orphanage to have on a, go on a hunger strike, that we will have one egg a week. And for three days, all the students, and I bullied them very well, so nobody would eat, and nobody will go to the dining room, and you know. So if you are a, a nonviolent activist, you have to be a bully sometimes. <laughs> and so after three days, then the orphanage administration, they accept that they'll give us an egg a week. And it was, it was hooray for us that we were able to change the administration time. The principles of nonviolence 
is taken so much from those who came before us, from Gandhi, from uh, Martin Luther King, from others group, and we build on those principles. But also we have to have a strategy for the Palestinian. So we wrote a strategy what we have to do to end the Israeli occupation. And in doing that, I always have the clear picture of what I want to do. And when I went back uh, to Palestine after having a psychology degree, I thought I will start a counseling center. And I started a Palestinian counseling center. It's now in six uh, cities uh, in Palestine. But it wasn't enough. People were afraid. They are scared of being under occupation. They are scared of everything. So I decided to write an ad in the newspaper and to do a workshop like this. But my workshop was how to get rid of Israeli occupation. And the first thing I have talking to the people is that we Palestinians, we are under occupation because we choose to be under occupation. And if we choose not to be occupation, we have to do every day something to upset the system of the Israelis. And that became something that direct my strategy in life over there. What to do every day, you have to, to get up in the morning, what today I have to do to make life miserable for those who occupy us. And we did. <clears throat> We started saying to the Palestinian, don't pay taxes for the Israelis. We start saying to the Palestinian, don't eat or drink any product that is not local or made in Israel. Mm -hmm. We start telling the Palestinian, you know, the watch you, that you carry, the time you carry, the Israelis say, change time. Why do we have to listen to them? We'll change time when we want to change time. So now, when you go back and you see what time, is it Palestinian time or Israeli time? <laughs> and that becomes uh, something. But on top of that, that we told the Palestinians that we have to get ourselves trained in nonviolence. And this training has to do a lot with changing our attitude that not only thinking that the armed struggle is the only solution for our efforts, that there is an alternative. So we went into the translation of books, of writing books, of uh, uh, getting books. I am not from a big family or a clan there. I am not uh, rich in, over there. But, uh, and being a Christian in a minority where everybody is Muslim there, I felt that it's not my duty in pushing uh, another alternative. And the other alternative was very tough for me. But I opened a center also, and it's the Palestinian Center for the Study of Nonviolence. And we did a lot of research of our Muslims inherently violent, are Arabs inherently violent? What king would do if he is in Jerusalem, if he's a Palestinian? What Gandhi would do if he is a Palestinian? And we went through those activities. So I have a bookmobile and uh, start distributing non-violent materials in villages. And if you know the Palestinian Arab community, if you go there after five o'clock and you are in distributing things, people say, where you are staying? I said, no, I don't know. I have a place to stay. Could I stay with you? And I'll stay and then we'll gather together and we talk about <coughs> nonviolence. I went to so many villages and there, if you want to find the hospitable people, they are so hospitable there. And we find it so good, but for me, it was good to teach them or to sit with them and to talk about nonviolence. It's very tough for a group of Palestinian or anybody to lose a country, to be under occupation, to have half of your population refugees, to divide. We are divided like four or five 
areas in Palestine. We have Palestinian who are Israeli, uh, Arab. We have Palestinian in Gaza. We have Palestinian in the West Bank. We have Palestinian in the, the, the Diaspora. We have Palestinian uh, in refugees. So we, we have so much divided. And we thought, what need to be done to bring those Palestinians together? And I have several things for you to really look at and see how those are. One of the things we are interested is having a very much a day, and we call it a Nakba, <coughs> and catastrophe, and uh, to have a Nakba, a day that many cities in the world could celebrate or think of putting what the Palestinians lost in 1948 and 67. So people who are not part of religion or part of politics, that any Palestinian can join together and have an idea of putting their life together as a whole group. And this will be done hopefully next year and we are pushing it hard. The second thing that I'm so much interested in is in communication. We in the United States, and especially European, forced by United States, and uh, sometimes Israel forced United States, don't talk to this group, don't talk to that group, don't talk to this person. So we took everybody that the, those three countries telling us not to talk to, that we, non-violent international, we talked to. So we went and talked to the Iranian. We went and talked to Hezbollah. We went and talked to Hamas. We went and met with leaders of uh, uh, any group that, uh, that they wouldn't see. And we felt strongly that we have to share with them the good news that there are alternatives than for their madness. And we did that. And believe me, all of them accept us very in a very good way that at least you come bravely and talk to us about it. And we did, and we sometimes we follow up on that, and that was very helpful. I have hope in Palestine. And the hope is because of what happened around the world. My hope is that if you look what happened in the United States, the blacks, they get their rights. What happened in South Africa, the blacks were freed in South Africa. What happened in Northern Ireland? And in Northern Ireland, between the Protestants and the Israelis, it was resolved. And what happened in the wall in Berlin? It was gone. And the demise of the Soviet Union. So all conflict have been resolved. And I believe very strongly that the Palestinian conflict will be resolved. It's my hope that it will be resolved without bloodshed and without death and without destruction. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. I would like to ask the seven people who are giving presentations to quickly come forward. say thank you to all those people I've worked with over many decades on peace campaigning. They have taught me a great deal, a great deal about the realities of war and a great deal about the possibilities of peace. We marched against the Iraq war in 2003, not because we were supporters of the regime of Saddam Hussein, but because we didn't want a war in the region and what we felt would be a decade or decades of subsequent wars and instability and we look now across the peace and it's a very difficult situation there has to be a political settlement in Syria there has to be support for the refugees but also there has to be determination around the world for a world order on all sides of the Atlantic and indeed all over the world we have to work together for peace 
just as we marched together against the Iraq war in 2003. Um, I'd just like to add uh, a few words from what Jeremy said and maybe ask him a couple of questions. Firstly, we've seen recently the escalation of tensions again around Korea, uh, which I'm sure is of great concern to everybody at the conference. We've had the testing of, of missiles by North Korea, but also the threat now from South Korea, which has released plans about how um, it will, will be prepared to destroy um, a whole whole cities, the whole capital of um, of North Korea, and uh, these are times we live in very very dangerous times. We have, um, as we speak, there's talk about a ceasefire in Syria, but we know this is only the beginning of a deadly um, of, a, of trying to end this deadly uh, conflict which has been going on and which which doesn't show massive signs of being able to do so. We also know the role of the various imperial powers in these in these countries and and we also have the question of nuclear weapons which i know is very very important to, to your conference um, this weekend we've we've had a debate over trident in parliament where we lost the vote for the um for uh, to stop the renewal of trident and despite jeremy's best efforts and the best efforts of a number of MPs. So there are those questions. I suppose what I'd like to just ask Jeremy to comment on before, um, just, just to bring this to a halt, is how, if Jeremy, if you were, and we hope you will be in government, we hope you'll be a prime minister. I won't comment on who might be the next president of the United States, because obviously that's um, a decision for you and maybe not a particularly happy one when you look at the record of both of them on war and peace. Um, I'd just like to ask you, Jeremy, what do you think, as a Prime Minister, you would do? What would be your steps towards bringing about a more peaceful world? First of all, there is obviously a crisis in Korea, across the Korean Peninsula and across the region. I would urge rapidly reopening of the six-party talks, rapidly moving towards demilitarisation of the Korean Peninsula and the whole region. That is a huge, very, very long-term objective, but immediately the reopening of the six-party talks has to be an important step forward and making the non-proliferation treaty a force that can deal with this. There are problems because Korea is not a signatory to the nuclear non-proliferation treaty, but the six-party talks work in parallel with them can help to bring that about. And Lindsay's right that in the situation in Syria at the moment it is clearly incredibly dangerous. There is a refugee crisis. Hundreds of thousands have been displaced or killed because of this war. And there has to be a humanitarian response to the refugee crisis, a ceasefire that means something. Each one of us in this room is a leader. As I look around the room and as I saw people coming in, I recognize individuals who I've met across the country and people who have taken a stand in their own community, people who were willing to uh, physically put themselves on the line to challenge this, this <coughs> corrupt system. And this gathering today is of consequence because we are participating in, in a unified field here, which resonates with people all over the country and all over the world. I have never met anyone who does not want peace or an end to war, but I've met countless people who do not believe we can achieve it. So that has led me to believe that the most entrenched obstacle we face is not the Pentagon, corporations, or the military industrial complex. Our greatest challenge is to help people um, believe peace is possible so that we can have the political and social will to achieve it. I was in the emergency hospital, one run by a wonderful crew of Italians. I have O negative blood, so they're always glad to see me in Kabul. And I asked them, do you have any survivors of the Kunduz hospital bombing with whom we might talk? And they said, oh, sure, this kid will love to have some visitors. This kid was Khaled Ahmed. He was a pharmacist. His mother told him, don't go to work because it was so dangerous. But he assured his mother, the hospital's never going to be bombed. 
And so he was awakened at 2 o'clock in the morning and in great fear, seeing the patients he had recently treated burning in their own beds, seeing that there were laser-like bombs being fired in all directions, knowing that they had to take apart their cell phones because they knew that the United States technology was such that these planes could lock on your cell phone and possibly kill you. He was told by security guards, make a run for it. Khalid ran, and he got to the gate, and he took shrapnel in his back. He rolled himself into a ditch. He'd taken apart his cell phone, but in Afghan culture, you call your father, you get in touch with your father if you know you're going to die, and you tell your father you're sorry for anything you might ever have done to hurt him or the family. And this young man with the one arm still working, losing consciousness, managed to put together the cell phone, call home, reached his mother. His mother is beside herself, and he kept saying, I must talk to dad put dad on the phone. And very fortunately, when the father got on the phone, he said, my son, take off your sweater, put it under you to stop the bleeding. Where are you? And he learned exactly where Khalid was. And relatives lived nearby. They fetched him out of the ditch and a five-hour drive to the next place where you could get health care in Kabul. When I met him, he asked me, why would your people want to do this to us? We were only trying to help people. And Matthew Aikens, Matt Aikens, really one of the finest war correspondents, I think, in the United States, um, wrote in a New York Times magazine response to the U.S. military report. And when the U.S. finally issued its report, its investigation of the Kunduz bombing, it said it was a disproportionate attack against a non-existent threat. Well, weren't they describing every single war this country has waged, a disproportionate response to a non-existent threat? When I was ambassador in Uzbekistan, uh, where the United States was cooperating with a dreadful dictatorship and where the CIA was sending people to be tortured as part of the extraordinary rendition program, um, the reason for that alliance uh, was mainly that American companies, initially Enron, in fact, had signed uh, contracts to monopolize Uzbekistan's natural gas reserves, and there was a plan to build a pipeline from Central Asia over Afghanistan, which was to be built by a company called Unical. And the, um, and the contract between Enron and the government of Uzbekistan uh, was actually signed in the office of the governor of Texas while George W. Bush was governor of Texas. And George H. W. Bush was on the board of Unical, who were meant to build the pipeline over Afghanistan. And that was the reason, if you like, for the Uzbek-US alliance, uh, which I found, uh, particularly the extraordinary rendition part, unconscionable, uh, which I tried to stop, and uh, instead I got sacked. The United States government recently gave more than a million dollars to the family of one victim it had killed in one of its wars. The victim happened to be Italian. If you were to find all the Iraqi families with any surviving members who had loved ones killed by the United States, it might be about a million families. A million times a million dollars would be enough to treat those Iraqis in this respect as if they were Europeans. Who can tell me? Raise your hand. How much is a million times a million? Right here. A trillion. Now, can you please count to a trillion starting with one? Go ahead. We'll wait. You, you can, the, 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 pro, yes, the problem with that is it would take, if you got to one number every second, it would take 31,709 years, and we have other speakers to get to. One of the first hearings I had was, as a member of the Government Oversight Committee, the Pentagon was asked to come forward to justify their budget, their spending, and it turned out they had over one trillion, T for trillion, dollars, in accounts that had not and could not be reconciled. Trillion dollars. Bombing people in Muslim countries is not creating security for Americans and is creating hell for the people in these countries. Wars are a tremendous waste of money. Two trillion dollars down a year down the drain, half of that spent by the United States. And when I saw they couldn't account for the spending, I was determined from that moment 
not to vote for a single appropriation for arms, for the military, and I kept that through 16 years in Congress because it's all a waste of money and it's a racket. You know, they try to justify this by saying, well, protect our troops, right? We heard that. We heard that at the beginning of the Iraq war. We have to keep funding the war to protect our troops. And we were saying, protect them, bring them home. So everyone says they're for peace, even people like President Obama and Prime Minister Netanyahu, men who are directly responsible for the killing of thousands of people. Now, not everyone is against war. Many people believe that, that there are such things as a just war or a necessary war. Although most people like to believe that they think of war as a last resort, in reality, they do not, due in large part to the corporate-owned media, they often think that it is an either-or situation, go to war or do nothing. Many people don't know about or understand the power of nonviolence and or are aware of the other tools that can be used in place of violence, militarism, and war. Of course, people like to imagine that there have been a few justifiable wars so that the chance of another one outweighs all the destruction of endless war preparation plus all the unjustifiable wars that that preparation produces. The United States simply had to fight a revolution against England. Although nonviolent corrections to injustices were working damn well, and the reason that Canada hasn't had to fight a revolution against England yet is because there are no touchdowns in hockey or something. We are explaining to people <laughs> that these ties with the Saudis have uh, spanned 12 different administrations, Democrat and Republican, uh, that we have um, to recognize that we are in bed with the regime that cuts off the heads of peaceful dissidents, uh, that has no elections for a president, no elections for any Congress, uh, that uses the death penalty for everything from homosexuality to uh, the spread of atheism. Any atheists in the room? Yeah, well, you would have a hard time in Saudi Arabia. Is there anyone who doesn't think that the wars that are going on in the streets of our country are not connected to the wars that, that were proliferating around the world? Native Americans today are still exploited, still stuck on reservations, and still suffering under government management. It isn't surprising that the Black Lives Matter movement has embraced the cause of the natives, currently seen in opposition to the Dakota Access Pipeline. Palestinian activists, thank you. Palestinian activists in that country, which also suffers under the heavy hand of US racism, and the Black Lives Matter movement offer mutual support. Perhaps more than ever before, divergent groups that experience US exploitation are aligning with each other to achieve mutual goals for justice. Mm -hmm.